Thanks for listening to the sermon podcast from the Potter's House Church in Virginia Beach. Our vision is winning souls, making disciples, and planning churches. You're about to hear a message that was preached live from one of our recent church services. We hope that you'll open your heart to hear the Holy Spirit speaking directly through this message. Stay tuned after the message for information on how to get connected with us. Thanks again, and enjoy today's message. I'm grateful for all that God is doing this morning. And I'm grateful that God uses people, people like us. The reason I say that, and the reason why I love to hear these testimonies, uh, Miss Teresa, Miss Maggie, uh, tonight we're going to hear a testimony from Miss Leanna, what happened on Wednesday, what a great miracle that was. And the reason I'm grateful for that is because God uses people, regular people, not the special kind, as if there were any. But he uses people like you and people like me. <clears throat> the kingdom of God is different from our world. In the world and in the West, I think we have something like a graduation mentality. In other words, before I can do anything meaningful or anything world-shaking, I have to pass a test or graduate a class. There are a few things that that works well for. For example, a driver's license, right? Before you get behind a 2,000-pound killing machine, uh, we want to make sure that you know the rules of the road and uh, that you can see well and that you're not going to use it to kill people. So it's a good idea that we should make people pass a test in order to have a driver's license. Also, medical doctors, for example. We want, we want to make sure if you're going to uh, get cared by someone at a hospital or a doctor's office that, uh, that they're, they're not novices, that they've had some training, and uh, it, it works well. But we, we can take that idea to an extreme, and especially when it comes to working in the kingdom of God. One of the hindrances I've seen from many people and in the church and getting things done for the kingdom is that there's, very, there's a lot of people who do not enter in to usefulness, into prayer, or into the pursuit of holiness because there is a lie that is echoing in their mind. And that lie is this, I'm not qualified. I'm not the kind of person that can fill in the blank. Somebody else might be that person, somebody who's more talented or more educated or more experienced or somebody who's better looking or has more money or somebody who's been around the things of God. Uh, maybe they could do it better than me, so I'm not qualified. How many ever had that thought run through your head when it comes to the things of God? Well, <clears throat> I just want to share a bit of a personal testimony. I got saved when I was 16 years old. I really got serious with God when I was about 17 years old. I became engaged when I was 18 years old. Got married when I was 19 years old. Entered ministry when I was about 21 years old. Began preaching the gospel uh, when I was 25 years old. Became a missionary overseas at the same time, 25 years old. And uh, the reason I'm mentioning all of that is I'm not boasting. I'm saying that if I would have waited to feel prepared, I'd probably still be waiting for all of those things. I would not have done them. Because more often in the kingdom of God, it requires the willingness to step out beyond your comfort zone into places and into activities which you do not feel prepared for. I want to challenge this congregation this morning the same way that God challenged Abram when he said, I want you to take you, your household, your family, all your possessions, pack them up, and I want you to move to a place. And he says, okay, where are we going? And he says, I'll show you when you get there. That don't make no sense, according to the world. How many know serving God is like that very often? He asks us to step out in faith for him, even though we don't feel fully confident, fully prepared, or fully qualified. And so this is a message I've titled, Why Not You? Let's read Mark chapter 6, 
verse 7, as we realize the work of the kingdom is done very often by people who feel unprepared, unqualified, who feel like novices, like they can't do things, but we believe in a God who prepares us to do his will. Let's read together. Mark chapter 6, beginning with verse 7, and he called the 12 to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power. Did you hear that? He gave them power over unclean spirits. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you or nor hear you, when you depart from there, shake the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So they went and preached that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Let's pray. Father, we come by the blood of Jesus and in the wonderful name of the one who can set the captives free and open prison doors. Lord, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is alive and working in this service today in the hearts of your people. I'm praying that you would encourage someone here today. Speak to our hearts. Prepare us for the work to which you've called us. We thank you, Lord, that you save us for a calling. You save us for an inheritance. You save us that we might be profitable servants in this time that you've given us. I'm praying, give us a vision and a heart, and we give you glory in Jesus' mighty name. God's people would say, amen. Why not you? Question mark. That's the question this morning. Let's first of all look at the person that we need. Verse 7, it says that he called the 12 to who? To himself. You got to keep up, everybody. He called the 12 to himself. The reason that's important, he did not call them to a church organization. He did not call them to a school of ministry. He did not call them to a denomination. He did not even call them to a position or a title. What did he call them to? He called them to himself. You're not going to be able to go very far with God unless, first of all, you come to Jesus. Everything, that is, that is the entryway, that is the door. Even Jesus said, I am the door. I am the gate through which the sheep enter in. Square one of the kingdom of God is coming to Jesus. That's, that's symbolic of our lives, of turning away from sin and trusting in the Lord. He calls these 12 to himself. It's a personal call. It is each individual has their own calling from Jesus to come and follow me. And I want to tell you that, uh, that God loves you enough that he has a personal call for you as well. We know there's a general call that it, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to everlasting life. Jesus died for the whole world, right? But there's also a very personal calling as well, that Jesus, he comes, and in the Scripture we see it very often. He called Peter to follow him. He called his brother, Andrew, to follow him. Uh, To the rich young ruler, he said, sell all that you have and come and follow me. Not every calling was exactly alike, but It was a personal calling. Can I just remind you this morning, God knows your name. God knows your situation. Jesus knows where you are. He knows what kind of challenges you face. He knows what kind of personality you have. He knows what kind of background you have, what kind of family you grew up in. He knows what kind of financial problems you might have. What I'm saying is that the call to follow Jesus not only is general, but personal. And he calls us all to follow Jesus him. The same Jesus who calls you then is the one who sends you. Verse 7, as he calls the 12 to himself, the Bible here says he began, say began. That means that he probably hasn't done this before. He began to send them out. 
Now, this is a very interesting action that Jesus, uh, a pattern that Jesus follows. He brings people close. He prepares them. He empowers them. He fills them with his spirit. And then he sends them out. Again, because it says began, it, it, it's a hint for us that this is probably the first time this is happening in the relationship between Jesus and his disciples. They have not done this yet. This is new activity for them. <clears throat> and so when you look at the timeline of when this takes place, this is just after John the Baptist has died in prison. They killed him. They took his head. And so, uh, so we can locate this on a timeline. This happens approximately halfway through the ministry of Jesus. We know that he was active in ministry for approximately three years. And so about a year and a half into this ministry period, Jesus is already beginning to think about his departure. He's beginning to think, okay, these guys need to be ready. If you're wondering why we're putting people behind the microphone <laughs> in our church service, right, people who uh, uh, are not as smooth talkers as me, perhaps, or, you know, uh, but why are, we, why are we putting people behind the pulpit to give announcements and prayer, prayer requests and those kinds of things? Why are we pushing people to do this? Well, for the same reason, because Jesus had in mind, I'm not going to be here forever. Somebody needs to be prepared for when I go. And so this is what Jesus is doing. He's training. He is beginning to think to the time when he is going back to the Father, and he says, these men need to be ready. Now, this is a good time because they are not beginners, right? They've been observing Jesus for approximately one year, one year and a half, most of them. They've seen him pray. They've seen him work with people. They've seen him travel. They've seen him preach. They have an example to follow, yes? And so they're not novices. They're not beginners. But they're also, they're not experts. Just like anything in life, you have to do it a few times in order to be prepared for it. Remember, if you're a parent, or maybe you can remember back to when you were a child, and you learned how to ride a bicycle, okay? Now, your parents can come, or if you're the parent, you can explain to your son, your daughter, okay, so here's what's going to happen. Uh, we, got it, we got this bicycle for you. Uh, you're going to sit on the seat, and you're going to hold on to the handlebars, and you're going to put your feet on the pedals, and you can give them instructions. And basically what happens is oh, I'm going to give you a little push, and then the wheels will start spinning, and then you're going to have to figure out how to balance, and, uh, and you can talk about it all day, right? Is your child going to learn how to ride the bike just by teaching them, just by speaking to them? No. You have to put their butt on a seat and put their hands on the handlebars and put their feet on the pedals. And you know what? That's dangerous. You know why? Because they're not going to get it the first try. They're going to fall down. They're going to get hurt a couple of times. But this is a good thing to learn, right? As soon as a child can ride a bicycle, it opens up new possibilities. It's good for exercise. It's good for transportation. You can go around the neighborhood. What I'm saying is that the, your child cannot learn this just by you speaking to them. They've got to do it. The same is true with anything that God gives to us. God teaches us when we do it. He shows us, and sometimes that can be dangerous in the church because we give somebody responsibility, we give somebody a task, we give somebody a vision, and it's possible for them to crash and burn in front of the whole congregation. Right? <laughs> so this is why many people are shying away from that. I, I don't know. I don't want to be a part of that. I'd rather, just, uh, I'd rather just do my thing. But Jesus began to send them out, even with the potential that they royally screw up this opportunity. Paul writes to his church in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and he says these words, I, I brethren, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babies in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. To this church in Corinth, Paul's rebuking them because he is reminding them that Christians need to be able to grow. 
spiritually. Need to be able to receive more than just the basic things. And he's rebuking them because he's saying, I wanted to teach more than just the simple things. I have some meat and potatoes for you, but all you could take was the bottle. And so there is a responsibility on those of us who are following Jesus. There is a responsibility that we are called to mature in our faith. And let me just say something about that. Finding maturity in Christ is like growing a plant, okay? And if you've ever done any farming or you've grown something in a pot, whatever, you'll, you'll figure out that you cannot make a plant grow. The control that you have is on the environment. You decide where to put the plant, whether it's going to be in sunshine or not, whether you remember to put the water into it, whether the soil is the, is the proper mixture. You have control over the environment and the atmosphere, what you don't have control over is how quickly a seed grows. Are you all following me this morning? The same is true in our lives. The same is true in the church. Each and every one of us, we are different personalities. We're going to grow in different ways. But the control that we do have is what is the atmosphere? What is the culture? What are the inputs that we're putting into our life? That's why I don't uh, I don't get angry at people, necessarily, who are not growing in the faith, but we have to examine what is the atmosphere? What are the inputs? Are you reading your word? Are you praying? Are you seeking holiness? You know, this is why Paul, he, he's expecting for people to grow. And he's saying, if they're not growing, it means there's something wrong with the environment. Because guess what? The seed is good. Jesus told that parable about the seed going into the four different kinds of soil. And that's what he said. He said, the seed is the word of God. That seed is good. We know that the seed is good. It works. But not everybody's heart is the same. The conditions are not all the same. And that's why you have some people who are struggling to grow in the faith and some people who are growing the way they're supposed to. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, we read this. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. There's a difference many times between what ought to be and what is. Have you found that to be true? When you look at your own life, I'm sure you can identify a few places where you're telling yourself, I ought to be further along by now, but I'm not. And so the question we have to ask then is why? If we know that the seed is good and we know that God wants us to grow so we can become fruitful and we can become a blessing wherever we go for God's kingdom, is there something in the environment, in the soil, in the culture that is causing me to be stunted in my growth? Now, I believe tonight or this morning that, uh, that God has a vision and a purpose for all of us, right? And I'm not talking necessarily uh, about becoming a preacher, although that, that is certainly part of this. And I, I pray that there would be potential uh, pastors and pastor's wives in the audience this morning. Uh, we need people of God to rise up and take on that, that ministry. But I understand not everybody's called to be a pastor. Not everybody's called to be a preacher. But you are called to something. How many believe that? God saved us for something. God saved us to, uh, to minister in our own lives, to become leaders in our home, to become husbands and wives. God prepares us. That's a calling. God has called some people to a business. God has called some people to a career. And none of those things are evil. But also, God has called us to participate in the building of the church of the living God. Jesus said, I will build my church, right? You remember that scripture? I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. How does Jesus build his church? Well, later on we read that we are the hands, we are the feet of Jesus in this broken world. So how does Jesus build his church? He uses, I know it's crazy to think about, he uses people like you. When you are saved, the Bible says we are all members of one body. 
Each of us have a different role to play, just like with your physical body. You have an ears, you have a set of ears, you have a set of eyes, you have a nose, you have a mouth, you have feet, you have hands, and each of them do different things, but we're all part of one body. Is that true? In the kingdom of God, God calls us all to separate callings, to separate giftings, to separate abilities, our time, our treasure, our talent. And I believe that the, the, the church of Jesus suffers when we begin to hold back what could be used for his kingdom. And I believe this is very often the reason because people have a graduation mentality. And they're saying to themselves, I know, I know God uses people, but not people like me. Not people like, not, not people in my situation. It couldn't possibly be. And so our call then from our scripture is to believe the words of Jesus. If he called them to himself, it says, then he began to send them. Now, Jesus knows the ones that he calls, right? <laughs> you know why he calls imperfect people? Because that's the only kind there are. If Jesus only called perfect people to build his, king his kingdom, he wouldn't have nobody. <laughs> The church would be very empty because there are no perfect people. Jesus did not call angels to build his church. Angels are God's messengers. They have their own thing that they do. Jesus calls people to be part of his work. And that can be very dangerous. It's like, man, I wonder sometimes if the angels are sitting around up in heaven and all the saints have gone before and they're looking at each other and they're looking down at all the problems that we got. And they're like, God, is there a plan B here? Are we really supposed to use these people? Because they got problems. And God says, yes, I know. I use people with problems. So good news. You're qualified. I love the scripture in Acts when it says that the Pharisees and the Sadducees looked at the disciples. And they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. A little study in the Greek language there. Uh, the word uneducated in Greek is agramatos, right? So gram that's the, the same word where we get grammar, like grammar school, like children. So when you add the prefix a at the beginning, it's like anti-grammar, anti-education. So the disciples were agramatos. They were uneducated. The other word is untrained. You know what the word in Greek is? You're going to like it. It's idiotes. You don't even need a translation for that one. They were idiots. They were untrained idiots. That was the best that the Pharisees could come up with. They were like, these guys, come on. But it doesn't stop there. It says they were uneducated. They were untrained. But they saw that they had been with Jesus. They had learned from Jesus. They had been trained by Jesus. They had... They had inherited his ministry in the earth. And because of their connection to Jesus, they had everything that they needed. Listen, can I give you some hope this morning? Whatever you're going through, when whatever you're facing, God has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. He brings you to himself, and he is going to send you into your destiny and purpose for the kingdom. And the way that he prepares you is by being with him. In this scripture, what's interesting is that he makes sure that they have no preparation, <laughs> that they feel completely inadequate. Look at what Jesus says to them. He says he gives, uh, gives them power over unclean spirits, but then verse 8, he commanded them, take nothing for the journey. How would you feel if you, know, if you got an airplane ticket leaving tomorrow morning and Jesus said, don't pack a bag? That's probably not a good idea, right? What is Jesus trying to tell them? Take nothing. Take except for a staff. That means a walking staff. But then don't take a bag. Don't take any bread. Don't put any money in your money belt. He says, wear your sandals, but don't take two tunics. So your tunic in the ancient world, man, that was, that was your overcoat. That was the thing. 
that you got to have. If the weather turns sour, it's the tunic that protects you. And he says, yeah, it's okay to bring one, but don't bring two. He's making sure that they feel a little unprepared about this. Why? Because he wants them to depend on him. He wants them to remain connected to him in spirit and in truth. This is such a wonderful thing about calling people into places and positions where they don't feel prepared. You know what happens? It makes you desperate. I can remember for the first time being called upon to preach a sermon. My first sermon was preached to a bunch of 13-year-olds, teen ministry. They probably didn't listen to a word I said because I didn't have a whole lot to say. (laughs) But I remember being given the date and the time that I was going to preach that sermon on a Friday night And I I think I had about three weeks to prepare. Can I tell you, the three weeks did not feel long enough. I was sweating over that message. I was praying. I was asking God, God, you got to help me. And then when the time came, like Friday, I got off work and I immediately, I said, I got to spend a few more hours on this message, man. And I'm writing and furiously and even leading right up to the service. I'm like, I'm looking through scriptures and, and the, the pastor, the, the leader at the time, he comes in, he says, are you ready, dude? I said, no, I'm not ready. I had three weeks to put this together. I didn't feel like I was ready. You know what he said to me? He said, well, I guess you're just going to have to preach what you got. I thought he was going to say, oh, no problem. I'll do this one. You can do the next one. But no, he put me behind that pulpit and all those little bug eyes looking at me. And you know what it forced me to do? It forced me to depend on God. I said, God, you got to help me. You got to fill in the gaps because I got nothing up here. And I've been doing the same ever since. Hallelujah. The Bible says that God, that Jesus gave them power. That's good news. They didn't have their money bag. They didn't have their second tunic. They didn't have uh, anything on the road except for a staff. But what did they have? They had the power of Jesus. They had his spirit. They had a little preview of Pentecost. He sent them out, and he gave them a commission. Can I tell you, if we would be willing to step out a foot and begin to move the direction that God has us to go, then he will be able to empower you, strengthen you, even when, and especially when, you don't feel prepared. So why not you? We heard some testimonies this morning from Miss Maggie and um, Miss Teresa. And we had, a, we had a whole group. We had 10 people come with us on that trip yesterday. I'm so grateful for them. But I I can almost guarantee that there's somebody here that it's possible you had the opportunity to go on this trip, but the reason you didn't was because, uh, I don't know if that's for me. I don't know if I I should put myself in that place. Am I really prepared to do that, to stand in the place of ministering for the gospel? The truth is, no, you're not. This is why, you know, we, we, we call on people to go you know, to our overseas impact team. Man, what a, what a blessing that is. We're going in August. we got a team of six people ready to go. Hallelujah. But is it possible that there's people who said, I, I might be able to go, I might be willing to go, but I don't feel like I'm that kind of a person? Well, I want to dispel that myth this morning. We need those who would be willing to step in to a position of usefulness for the kingdom. And instead of asking, why me? What I would like to ask, ask you to ask yourself is this. Why not me? It's a different perspective. If God can use the apostles, then why not me? If God can use Miss Maggie, then why not me? If God can use Miss Teresa, then why not me? As I close, I just want to remind you, there's a long list of unprepared and unqualified people in the Word of God. Adam was the first man who was a blame shifter and a finger pointer who could not resist peer pressure. Eve could not control her appetite. Perhaps she had the first eating disorder. She had a control freak attitude. 
Cain, the firstborn human being, was a murderer. Noah, the last righteous man on earth, got drunk. Got so drunk, he got naked drunk. Abraham, the father of our faith, let other men walk away with his wife two times. Excuse me? Sarah, the most gorgeous woman by popular opinion, let her husband sleep with another man. Wait, woman. That was, that was the new Bible, the woke Bible. You know what I'm talking about. Lot had a serious problem choosing the wrong company. Job, the epitome of faith, had a nagging and faithless wife. Isaac, nearly killed by his father, talked his wife into concealing their marriage. Rebecca, the first mail order bride, turned, turned out she was pretty manipulative also. Jacob had a wrestling match with God. He was also a pathological deceiver. Rachel was a nomadic kleptomaniac idol worshiper. Reuben, the pride and firstborn of Jacob, was a pervert who slept with his father's concubine. Moses had a speech impediment and a serious temper problem. Aaron, <laughs> he made an idol while his brother was up on the mountain for the people to worship. Miriam, the songwriter, had sibling jealousy and greed for power. Samson put Arnold Schwarzenegger and Dwayne The Rock Johnson to shame, but joined himself to a Philistine and took his own life. Eli ruled over Israel as priest, but lost his sons to immorality and an untimely death. Saul, the first king of Israel, was a psychotic, manic burst of anger, episodes of depression, traces of paranoia. He ultimately committed suicide. David, a man who, called, who was called by God, a man after my own heart, concealed his adultery with a murder. His family was a train wreck. Solomon, the wisest man in the world, was arguably the world's greatest sex addict. Kind of a problem? All the kings after him had mammoth issues of idolatry in their lives. Hosea, an incredibly forgiving prophet, grappled with the pain of a wife who would not stay at home. The prophets, all of them, even as they were speaking for God, struggled with impurity, depression, unfaithful spouses, broken families. The list goes on and on. Peter denied and cursed. Thomas doubted. And guess what? We have some problems too. Why am I back-talking all of these wonderful heroes of the faith? Because even with all of their problems, they're still heroes of the faith. You read Hebrews chapter 12, the hall of fame of faith. I didn't find any perfect people in there. And yet God used all of them for specific times and purposes. So I challenge you today, instead of asking, God, why me? And doing nothing, how about... We ask, God, why not me? And do something. Do something for the kingdom. Be a blessing to somebody. Minister to somebody. Go on an outreach, an impact team. We got another one coming up in a few weeks. And God, I believe God will raise you up. God will empower you. And even though we might seem untrained, ill-equipped, uneducated, unprepared, lacking understanding, yeah, it's all true, but if we will be with God, Jesus. He will help us. Let's bow our heads. We'll close our eyes for just a moment. I thank you all for your attention and your time this morning as we bring this service to a close. I believe God is faithful to help us in our time of need. This is not just a message for the experienced in the faith. This is especially those who are are wondering if God could use them. Young people, and this morning, before we close this service, 
We're going to open the altar for prayer that God is going to encourage us and empower us and strengthen us to find ourselves in God's will. But before we do that, step one of this journey of faith is to know him. It says that Jesus called them to himself. And that is our first calling, our first priority above all things. It's not a calling to a church or a ministry or denomination. It is calling to Jesus. Jesus said, if I would be lifted up, then I would draw all men unto myself. And that's what he wants to do first of all here. You're here this morning. You're not right with God. You be honest for a moment. You're not... Uh, you're not living for God. You're in your sin. You're in rebellion against the Most High God. And that's the worst place you could be because if we die in our sin, the Bible says we will pay the price. We will pay the penalty for our sins. And the wages of sin is death. But I have good news for you. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And if you're here today, you be honest and say, Lord, I need a Savior. I need someone to set me free. I need a I need a new lease. I need <clears throat> I need God to set me free. The Bible has this great promise. If we would be faithful to ask him for forgiveness, to turn from our sin and trust in the Lord, he is faithful and he is just to hear your prayer and to forgive you and cleanse you from all sins. And if you need that here, I don't want I do want to pray for you. I don't want to miss a sincere desire of someone's heart here this morning. Say, Pastor, please pray for me. I'm not right with God, but I want to be. Somebody here, you'd lift up your hand and say, please pray for me, Pastor. I need what you're talking about. Would you lift up your hand right now? I want to pray with you. Is there someone here? Quickly, God's dealing with hearts. Unsaved. You're lost. You're far from the Lord. His presence, not a part of your life. You're walking in the strength of your own flesh. In your own understanding following your heart. The heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it, the Bible says. And I want to challenge you. Is there someone here? Quickly. You want to turn from sin and trust in the Lord Jesus. Would you quickly lift up your hand? Somebody here. God's dealing with you. We want to pray. Is there anyone at all? Quickly. Amen. And I want to, I want to speak to the congregation, trusting that we're all saved. We're followers of Jesus trusting that he has moved in your life and done a miracle. So the devil, I've talked in the past about the devil's plan B. Plan A is to drag you to hell. And he's pretty good at that plan. But for those of us who are saved, our sins are forgiven, we've asked God to set us free, then the devil has plan B, and that is to make us ineffective to make us fruitless, to make us useless for the kingdom. And he is also very effective at that. Well, he'll he'll say to you, yeah, okay, you can go to heaven, but don't bring anybody with you. I'd just like you to be on your own. But what we see in our scripture this morning is that Jesus saves us and then he sends us. Like the bread at the miracle where he fed the 5,000, it says that he took the bread, he broke the bread, and then he distributed the bread. That is a picture of your life and mine. He receives us, he breaks us, so that we can then be used for his kingdom and distributed. God wants to use your life, your talents, your abilities, even with your problems and the challenges that you're facing. And I believe God wants to shift somebody's mind here this morning. You've been asking, why me? Why not somebody else? And I want you to begin to ask, why not me? Why couldn't God use my life? Why couldn't I make an impact? Why couldn't I witness to somebody? Why couldn't I go on an impact team? Why couldn't I get involved in a ministry? And I want to encourage you this morning. We're going to open this altar for prayer. The kingdom of God is populated by imperfect people. That's good news. If you're an imperfect person and you sense the Lord leading you, even through the lack of preparation, I want to ask you to join us here for prayer. Let's stand up to our feet this morning, church. We're going to pray right here at this altar.
Yes, I, I believe God is moving in this service today. God is speaking to some people. We, uh, we're going to receive the Lord's Supper in just a moment here. Uh, but I do just want to encourage you with a prayer. I want to believe God with you. Oftentimes when we talk about the calling, the calling of God, we often talk about that in the context of the church because we see it so obviously working within the context of the church. But our calling is, is greater than just that. Also in our families. Calling is in our families. It's in our workplace. I ask you, where do you spend most of your weekday? Right? Like eight hours a day, most people are working a job. You have an audience there. You have people that God has put in your orbit that maybe nobody else in the church knows. Maybe they they don't go to another church. They don't read the Bible. But you could make an impact in their life. You could speak to them. You could encourage them. You could pray for them. You could witness to them. And I I, I don't want anybody here to be limited by the idea of why me. Let's instead ask, why not me? Let's lift up our hands in prayer. Let's just say these words together. Say, God in heaven, I thank you that you use imperfect people that you have called us to yourself. And I sense your calling and your purpose. I need your power. I need your strength. I need your spirit to overcome my flaws, my problems, my challenges. Lord, even in those things, I believe you can use my life. I will be a living sacrifice set apart for your kingdom. And I thank you for each day that you give me to live for you. Help me, Lord. Speak to me and lead me in righteousness. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Come on, let's give the Lord praise together. Hallelujah. We magnify your name. We're grateful for the calling and the power of the Most High God. Listen, uh, God cannot use those who are unholy, by the way. Your first calling is to be right with God, right? So this is not, this is not, uh, you can keep sinning and still do anything you want to do for the kingdom. No, God needs clean, willing vessels. And so we have to be serious then about our calling to holiness and our prayer life, and our Bible study, and our accountability to one another in the, in the faith. And, um, but as we do that, God will encourage you. God will strengthen you. Amen. Thank you for listening to this message from the Potter's House Church in Virginia Beach. If you sense the Holy Spirit drawing you out of your sins and into a new life with Him, pray this prayer from your heart today. God in heaven, I know I've sinned against you. I've hurt people, I've hurt myself, and I've broken your laws. Today, I turn from my sins as I surrender to your perfect will. I believe Jesus Christ is your Son and that He died and rose again for me. I receive Him today as my Lord and Savior. May the old things of my past pass away as you make me a new creation. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit to give me strength to live for you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. We want to help you live for God. Please join us in person for one of our upcoming church services. We are located in the heart of Virginia Beach at 1045 Lynn Haven Parkway, about one mile from the Lynn Haven Mall. Please check the show notes for links to our website and social media. You can also find a link to support this ministry with a generous donation. We would be so grateful. We look forward to sharing future messages here on the VBPH Sermon Podcast. In the meantime, we pray that God would strengthen you to serve Him with all your heart.